Good. So this is where we finished yesterday, the matrix square root, and what I want to look at now is convergence of uh, this iteration, how to prove convergence of it. So remember, this is Newton's method applied to the equation x squared minus a is naught, um, with the simplifying assumption that a commutes with x naught. If a doesn't commute with x naught, this is not the same as the full Newton's method. But what can we say about the convergence of iteration star? Well, one way to analyse convergence <coughs> is to use the Jordan canonical form. So, um, if we assume that x0 is actually a polynomial in the matrix A, then all the iterates will also be polynomials in A. Um, just going back to the iteration, the reason for that is that if x0 is a polynomial in A, um, then it commutes with A. Um, this whole expression is just some function of A. And we know that functions of A are polynomials in A. So um, if we assume that x0 is a poly in A, then by induction, every one of the xk's is a poly in A. So they will all have the same Jordan form. Or the same, the, the same z matrix in the Jordan form. So what I'm going to do here is plug in the Jordan form for A, um, redefine some new iterates y, which are the transformed versions of the x's using the Jordan uh, similarity z. And you get a new iteration in the y's, which starts with j, the Jordan matrix, and iterates in, in that fashion there. And because y is upper triangular, and the inverse of a triangular matrix is also triangular, it's easy to see that all the y's will be upper triangular. So this is now a bit easier to analyse. So in particular, if you look at the diagonal of this triangular matrix, on, on the, the diagonal elements are just satisfying uh, this recurrence here. So we start off with an eigenvalue that comes from the diagonal of J, and it gets iterated according to this formula. And this is Heron's iteration for the square root of a scalar, for the square root of lambda. So that's the classical Heron iteration. And so we know that um, this converges to um, a square root of lambda. So the diagonal, the convergence of the eigenvalues then is um, immediate from classical results. Um, but what about the convergence of the off-diagonal part of y? That's a bit less obvious. And I think this is how it was, convergence was proved in that original paper I mentioned just today from 1958 by Larsonen. So to, to get the convergence of the off-diagonal is, is a bit fiddly. And I was just recalling um, to myself that I should have something in my book on this. So there's a theorem there, theorem 4.15, that gives a general result that, that says that if the diagonal converges with the Jordan, um, starting with the Jordan matrix, then the off-diagonal will converge as well. But you, you can see the result's quite complicated, and the proof is, a, is at least a page. So it, it's not trivial to, um, to argue that, um, that the off-diagonal part converges. And there are some subtleties associated with that. So that, that's not my favourite way of proceeding. So I'm going to um, abandon that. And when I was writing my book on matrix functions, I wanted to give, obviously give a proof of the convergence of this iteration. And didn't really want to do it this way. But I eventually realised that there's a, there's a much nicer way of doing this. That uh, in, a, in a sense much more elementary. And uses something we know already. So what this theorem does is connects the Newton iteration to the sine iteration. Um, just let me go back. There's one other issue that um, is worth, com oops, worth commenting on here. Notice I said um, let x0 equal p of a there. Um, well, what if you only knew that x0 commuted with a? This, this kind of analysis doesn't work with this weaker assumption. And it's just worth 
comparing those two things. So one statement is that x0 commutes with a. Okay, another statement is that x0 is a polynomial at a. So how are those two statements related? Are they equivalent, those two statements, or is one of them stronger than the other? Uh, I think it's clear, if x is a poly in A, then it, it commutes with A. So this one implies that one. That's uh, immediate. Is the converse true? Does, commuting, does the fact that you commute with A mean that you're a polynomial in A? No, it doesn't. It would if A was diagonalizable, but if... Um, so it would if A was non-derogatory, rather. Now, a derogatory matrix is one whose Jordan form has the same eigenvalue in more than one Jordan block. And I think if A is non-derogatory, then the reverse implication is true. Otherwise, it's not. In fact, if you take an, an extreme case, is take A the identity. If A is I, then um, X0 certainly satisfies this condition. But X0 doesn't have to be a polynomial in I. So the, the reverse comp... Um, implication is definitely false. Um, interestingly, there is a slight variation on this that, um, that does work. So if, if X0 commutes with every matrix that commutes with A, then it is true that X is PA x naught is a polynomial. Okay. It's maybe a bit early in the morning for this statement. It's, it's a bit of a mind-bender. So if x naught commutes with every matrix that itself commutes with A, then it's a theorem that x naught is a polynomial in A. So it's not enough to commute with A, you've got to commute with every matrix that itself commutes with A. Okay. Then, then you would have the reverse implication. So there's some subtleties there in, in this... Um, in this assumption about x0. And in this result here, um, all I need to assume is that x0 commutes with a. There's no assumption about being a polynomial in a. So this is perfectly general, this, this result. So the idea of the result is, um, I'm going to redefine, or define some iterates, um, the s's. So the x's are my square root iterates. And I'm claiming that the x's are related to the s's, which are from a sign iteration, with this starting value this sign iteration. So in other words, proving convergence of the x's will now be equivalent to proving convergence of the s's. And the convergence of the s's will follow from our previous result about the convergence of the sign iteration. Um, so all we have to do is apply that previous result to the s iteration. Okay. So underlying the Newton square root iteration, there really is a Newton sign iteration going on. Um, so let's just... Uh, look at the proof of that. The proof's very easy. Um, so we've got S0 is a to the minus a half X0. Um, and that means that S0 commutes with A. The reason for that is that we know that a to the minus a half is a, a function of a. It's therefore a polynomial in a. And so um, polynomial in a times some, something that commutes with a will, will certainly commute with a. And so the proof is, is inductive. Assume that uh, xk, which is a to the half sk, um, and that that commutes with A. Oh, sorry, the SK commutes with A. Um, 
Um, then I want to look at. Uh, well, then I can say that SK commutes with A to the half. So if SK commutes with A, it also commutes with A to the half. The reason is that A to the half is a polynomial in A. So um, that's a straightforward implication. Um, and if I look at XK plus 1, it's a half. The definition of the iteration, the square root iteration, is this. Now I just plug in my formula um, for xk in terms of sk. So that's a half, um, a to the half sk <coughs> plus the inverse of that, a to the minus a half sk to the minus 1a. Uh, no, I need to invert the factors. I've not done that. It's the wrong way around. It's SK inverse A to the minus a half. And so I'm going to get a little bit of cancellation here. This will just be A to the half. <coughs> and that is the same as um, A to the half into half of SK plus SK inverse um, using the fact that S SK commutes with A to the half. So basically everything commutes with everything else um, here, which uh, is nice. So that is A to the half XK. Uh, uh, XK plus one, rather. And to, to finish this induction, I need to check that the new XK or the new SK um, commutes with A. Um, so I can say and, and SK plus 1 times A is A times SK plus 1. Uh, well, just because of the same thing for SK. SK plus 1 is half SK plus SK inverse. That's, again, a polynomial in SK. Um, where? Oh, this. That should be S, yeah, thanks. Uh, SK plus 1. Yeah. OK, so it's, that, that's it, really. Uh, it just all falls out very, very naturally. which is the sign of a good, well, to me that's the sign you've got the theorem right if the proof is, uh, is simple. So um, the XKs converge if the S's converge, and they will converge to, to this, okay, to sine of S0. Um, and this iteration certainly converges as long as S0 has no pure imaginary eigenvalues. That was from our result on the sine function. So, so, you know, we've just reduced the problem to one we've solved already. Works very nicely. Um, and uh, so what I'm really interested in is does this converge to a to the half? The, does it converge to the principal square root? Well, that would be the case if sine of s naught is i. So when is sine of s naught i? Um, well, when the eigenvalues of this thing lie in the right half plane. And if I take x0 is a, then this is just a to the half. And a to the half certainly has eigenvalues in the right half plane by, by definition, really. <coughs> so I can cl conclude that if x0 is a, then I get convergence to the principal square root, which is what I wanted. Okay. 
interesting thing is that if you take x naught is i, then x1 is a half, the formula is half of x naught plus x to the uh, plus a versus x naught. So the square iteration, no, it's x, xk inverse a, x naught inverse a. So if you take x naught is i, this is just a half of i plus a, which is the same as for uh, x naught is a. So x naught is i and x naught is a give you the same x1. So this is interesting. So I think that's, that's the best way to prove convergence. Uh, just reducing things to the sign iteration. Okay, so we know it converges. Um, as I said just today, we know there can be some problems with stability. And if you want to check that, just you know, just program this in MATLAB. It's a one-liner. Just take any positive definite a, for example, and just do that loop, uh, and you'll find um, it's easy to generate examples where this this just blows up, fails to converge due to round off. So how can we understand what's going on as regards the finite precision behavior of this iteration? Um, well, here's the way I think is the, now the best way to do this. And this is a, a general approach to analyzing stability of an iteration. So the definition is that if we have an iteration xk plus 1 is g of xk, now we ha this iteration has a fixed point x, we assume. And that's what we're interested in computing. And I'll say it's stable. Um, around the fixed point if the Fréchet derivative of the iteration function has bounded powers. Okay. So that's a general definition for any iteration. So let me just give a bit of motivation for that definition. Oops. Um, so first of all, just think of the scalar case and check whether this, um, what this says here. Um, I think the wording on, on that, that sentence is, could have been a bit clearer. Uh, so what I meant was for scalar and superlinearly convergent G. So I'm considering a scalar function G for which this iteration is superlinearly convergent. Then the Fréchet derivative is just the standard derivative, um, which is zero. And um, zero certainly has bounded powers. So in, in the scalar case, there's there's nothing to this definition at all. Okay, it's entirely trivial. In the matrix case, there's a bit more going on. So let's just look at this line where I've got xk plus 1. So xk plus 1, um, I'm thinking of the... the so xk plus 1 is the, the limit point, the fixed point, plus some perturbation. And it's defined as g of xk, which is g of xk plus e, or ek. Okay, so the ek is the difference between the fixed point that I want and the iterate that I've got. And I can expand this as g of xk plus the Fréchet derivative xke. Oh, I've used a different notation here. So, Yeah, so here I've called it dgx of ek. Previously I was calling it L sub g. It's just the Fréchet derivative at x in the direction ek. That's the same thing. Uh, plus little o norm of ek. Okay. So that's just the definition of Fréchet derivative written down there. Uh, 
So that should be gx, not xk. Um, in fact, all these things should be x, not xk. So I'm spending x plus ek in that way there. Um, and g of x is just x, because it's, that's the fixed point of the iteration. So I've got an x over here, I've got an x over here. They cancel, and I end up with ek plus 1 is um, the fresh air derivative plus some little o term. OK, that's this expression here. So the new error is the old error um, being acted on by the fresh air derivative. And if I repeat that, pr that, that recurrence, I can write the ek as the fresh derivative acting on the ek minus 1, and I can just iterate back, back all, the way, all the way to e naught. So I've got powers of the fresh derivative on the original perturbation. So if I want this, uh, so I want the e's to be bounded, what I need is for the powers of the fresh derivative to be bounded. Okay, so that's, that's the motivation for the proof. This recurrence says the new error is the derivative um, acting on the old error, so I want the derivative to be at least bounded, um, so that the effect of a perturbation on the iterates is bounded in the rest of the iteration. Um, so if, if all the fresh derivatives have got norm bounded by C, then the kth derivative will have um, there's some possible linear growth here, but um, I'm, I'm willing to allow a bit of growth, but, but nothing too serious. So that is just a definition of stability. A reasonable definition of stability near the fixed point x. Um, so I want to apply this with, the, with g being my square root iteration and x being the, um, the, the desired square root. Um, so let's see what happens in that case. So the function g is a half of x plus x inverse a. Uh, we need the fresh air derivative of that. So how do we get it? How do you get the fresh air derivative of the matrix inverse? Any quick ideas? What's the, what's the easiest way to get the, the derivative of x inverse? It's like I said just today with the, with the uh, or Tuesday when we get the derivative of x squared, just do it from first principles. We want to look at x plus e inverse minus x inverse. Um, and we know that x plus, well, you may be able to remember that, that that's given by this. Um, so that's so this here is the derivative um, d, well. L x inverse x and e. So I'm just using the usual uh, expansion for x plus e inverse. If you can't remember that, think of it this way. x plus e is x into i plus x inverse e. And if you then invert this equation, And we just expand this in the binomial expansion to get the, um, the first two terms. OK, so the, the inverse of the derivative is minus x inverse e x inverse. And so that's what gives me the, the second line on the slide. So then I have to think, what is my fixed point? My fixed point is a to the half. So I'll replace x by a to the half. And I've now got this uh, expression here. So this is my derivative, whose powers I want to show are bounded. OK, so I've got this thing here. I want to show its powers are bounded. Um, well, I can do that if I can show that all the eigenvalues are inside the unit uh, disk. So I want to find the eigenvalues of this fresh air derivative. 
how can I do that? Um, well, um, I'd say to find the eigenvalues of the Frisch derivative, there's a couple of possible approaches. Um, the the more mechanical approach that is a bit harder is to say, well, I don't, I'm not happy working with Frisch derivatives. I don't know what they are, but I'm happy working with matrices. So let's convert this to a matrix. So I could say, let's vec the uh, Frisch derivative. So vec of dg a to the half um, of e is vec of half e minus a to the minus a half e a to the half. So just apply the vec operator. This is the stacks the columns of the matrix into one long vector. And there's, there's a formula for the vec of a product of matrices. The vec of AXB is B transpose chronica A times vec of X. So if this is a the one formula I always remember. Um, vec of A times X times B is B transpose chronic product A times vec X. Um, you might be about to ask me what the chronic product is. Uh, I'm not going to tell you because I'm not going to actually use this approach. Um, you can Google that to find out what it is. But if you do follow this approach, um, what you're going to get here is half of um, vec of E minus, and then apply that result so it's a to the half chronica a to the minus a half times vec of e. And I can take the vec e outside, in fact, so write it like this. Okay. So I've got some matrix times some vector. And what I would then need to do is find the eigenvalues of this matrix. I minus a to the half, chronica a to the minus a half. Oh, I missed a transpose. It's a to the half transpose, in fact. So that can be done. There are formulae for things like this, for the eigenvalues of them. Um, if you look in Horn and Johnson or Lancaster and Tismanetsky or in the appendix of my book, there are formulae that will help you get the eigenvalues of that matrix. So that's one way to do it. Um, but I think a better way to do it is to not vec everything and stay in the um, original um, matrix space. Because if you think, what, what are the eigenvectors of, the, of a chronica, uh, of a fresh derivative? Well, they're going to be matrices. And if they're going to be matrices, then hopefully they're going to be quite simple matrices. What are simple matrices? Sim simple matrices are rank 1 matrices. So if you think about it for a bit, you can convince yourself that the, the, the vectors E, or the matrices E, that are eigenvectors, so to speak, could well be rank 1 matrices. And so you might just then guess, um, if I have an eigenvector of A, Z, then a reasonable guess for an eigenvector of E is this rank 1 outer product. So if the Zi's are the eigenvalues of A with corresponding eigenvalues lambda I, then it's reasonable to have a guess at this outer product as being an eigenvector of the um, fresh A derivative. So let's just check if that does any good. So dg A to the half E for this E is going to be a half Zi Zj star minus a to the minus a half, plug in the Zi Z star again. Then I want to look more carefully at these two pieces here. So Zj is an eigenvector of a, therefore it's also an eigenvector of a to the half. And zj a to the half will just be lambda j to the half zj star. Uh, 
Um, actually, ZJ is a left eigenvector, isn't it? So, okay. so to be more precise, ZJ star A is lambda J um, ZJ star. So ZJ star is actually a, a left eigenvector of A here. And A to the minus a half ZI will be lambda I to the minus a half ZI. Because again, ZI, if it's an eigenvector of A, it's also an eigenvector of A to the half or A to the minus a half with eigenvalue lambda I to the minus a half. And if you simplify that out, it's going to be a half, 1 minus lambda j to the half over lambda i to the half times zi zj star. And this is, is our e. That's e. And, and that's what we mean by an eigenvector of the Fresher derivative. It's a matrix E, so that when you apply the Fresher derivative to that matrix, you get something back in the same direction. But now multiply by this factor here. So that's the scale factor. So this rank 1E is indeed an eigenvector of the, um, of the Fresher derivative. And, the eigenvalue, and so the eigenvalue of the Fresher derivative is, is this term. Um, and hence, I've essentially justified my statement here that the eigenvalues of the Fresher derivative are these quantities. Okay. So I now want those eigenvalues to be bounded by 1. So if I impose that condition, that those eigenvalues are bounded by 1, um, then I get this uh, condition in the yellow box. And if we go back to the case of, uh, or specialise to the case of Hermitian positive definite, So if A is uh, Hermitian positive definite, then all the, the lambdas are positive. And so if I look at this condition, I've got a half of mod of 1 minus lambda i over lambda j to the half, the mod of that less than 1. Um, So that's less than 2. So basically this, since the lambdas are all positive, what I really need is that lambda i over lambda j to the half is less than 3 for all i and j. So in particular, if I take the largest eigenvalue on the top and the smallest one on the bottom, that's going to give the most restrictive condition. So the most restrictive condition is that, and that's the same as the condition number of A to the half less than 3, or kappa 2A less than 9. Because for a, for a positive F matrix, the condition number is the largest over the smallest eigenvalue. So that's where I get the kappa 2 less than 9 from, okay, from that, uh, that argument. And that was essentially Larson's result from 1958. Okay, so I guess the point is that this this way of doing things via the Fresher derivative it sounds a bit you might say it's unnecessarily complicated, but it's very general, and it's actually quite easy to work with. Uh, you, you just end up having to find eigenvalues of a Fresher derivative, which is usually not that difficult. So that's a neat way of getting um, this condition for stability of the iteration. And so what, what does this con condition mean in practice? Well, it means in practice that the iteration is of virtually no practical use whatsoever. You can hardly find any matrices you know, with condition number less than 9. It's uh, an extremely strong condition. You have to be virtually the identity matrix to satisfy that. So in its, in its basic form, this Newton iteration is not a good idea. Um, and I'm, I've not got time to go into any details here, but there are all sorts of ways of modifying this iteration to make it stable. There's, so there is a whole host of different iterations that are stable. And one idea that is pretty useful here is to convert this single iteration into two iterations. So if you set up two different iterations, two coupled iterations, one of which converges to a to the half, the other of which converges to a to the minus a half, turns out that, that um, if you do that in the right way, that is numerically stable. 
it will always satisfy this, this condition of the fresher derivative having bounded powers. And there are other areas in numerical analysis where the idea of coupling iterations does lead to stability. So the idea of going from a single iteration to two iterations, it's not unusual that that can improve stability. Um, and, and it does here. So that is one way you can stabilize the, uh, the square root iteration. But as I say, I've not got time to go into that. If you want to know more, you can look in the book or um, several of my papers uh, describe this. But I, so just to summarize, um, the advantages of this fresh derivative approach are um, well, minimal assumptions on A. I've not had to make any assumptions at all, really, to get the, uh, the condition for stability. Um, I've said here the perturbation analysis is all in the definition. So I think that's an important point. Um, if you do it from first principles, then every time you're sort of redoing the definition and expanding and then throwing away second order terms. So if you just start from this definition, what remains is simply uh, a little bit of analysis to find some eigenvalues. Um, and this can be sometimes done quite generally for a whole family of iterations. So um, I think it's a nice approach. What about the sine iteration? So we had our sine iteration last time. So going back to the matrix sine iteration, SK plus 1 is a half SK plus SK inverse with S0 is A. We might now ask, is that iteration stable? Um, when I was writing my book, and I have a, a chapter on the sine function, um, I asked myself that question, and then I realized that nobody in, in the quite large sine function literature had ever discussed stability of this iteration. Um, so clearly, it, it's always stable in practice, and nobody even questioned whether it, you could prove it was stable. Um, now, in a sense, from what we've just done, it's kind of obvious it is stable, because this is just the square root iteration, with, which would have an a there, with a replaced by i. Okay. And if a is i, then the, the, condition number, the, the, the condition on the eigenvalues on the previous slide is, is true. Kappa 2a is 1, which is certainly less than 9. So in a sense, this, this stability follows from what we just did, except that the starting matrix... Um, so if I think of this having an i here, but the trouble is I've still got an a there, and that would have to be i as well to be the square root. So it, it doesn't quite follow from the previous slide, if intuitively it ought to. Um, but here's a result that, that settles this question once and for all. So you can take any iteration you like for computing the sine function, as long as it's at least superlinearly convergent. Um, and then the, the result says that the fresh derivative will necessarily have this form. So it doesn't matter what the iteration is, they'll all have the same fresh derivative at, at the solution. So dg of s, this is the limit point. It has to be a half of e uh, minus SES. And the theorem then says that uh, hence DGS is idempotent and the iteration is stable. So just let me explain that last part of the theorem. Idempotent means when you square something you get back the same thing. Or when you apply it twice. So is this DG here idempotent? Let's just check that. So what I want to do is, in fact, apply um, dg not to e, but to itself. So I want dgs of dgs of e, and I want to see if I get back dgs of e. So let's just do it. I don't think it's not immediately obvious, so it's worth checking this. So we have to work out the Fisher derivative. In a, at s in the direction half e minus SES. And so we just apply the formula again. So it's a half of the e, which is the thing in the brackets, minus SES.
and let's just see how this simplifies. Um, well, I can take out a quarter, E minus SES. I've got an SES there, and S squared is I, so the last part will just be um, plus E, I think. S squared is I. And yeah, this simplifies, it is just a half of E minus SES. So it is actually idempotent, as claimed in the theorem. Okay. So the last part of the theorem then says, and the iteration is stable, so why and the iteration is stable? Well, if, if a function is idempotent, then its eigenvalues are all um, equal to 1. So automatically, the... Um, well, no, no, more fundamentally, I should say, the point is, we, we want the, the, the powers of the Fraser derivative to be bounded. They're bounded because all the powers are just the same thing we started with. So you don't even have to think of the eigenvalues. An idempotent function certainly has bounded powers because all the powers are equal to the function itself. So it, trivially, um, we have stability here. So, so what's nice about that result is it doesn't just apply to the Newton iteration. It applies to essentially any sine function that anyone has ever uh, derived any sign iteration is automatically stable by that analysis. So I was quite surprised when it came out um, as such a strong result. So this is the key thing though, that all, all the sign iterations have got the same um, fresher derivative at the limit point. Okay, any questions? So there are plenty of other sign iterations, and I, I could. There's, there's all sorts of lovely results here. Um, this is just a, a slight uh, appetizer for for what's out there. But if you start with the standard Newton iteration, uh, I've written these in scalar form here for simplicity. So that's the standard Newton for the sine function. If you invert the iteration on both sides, um, you can get this iteration. Which is so this this x is essentially the inverse of the of the x in the previous iteration. So this is now a different iteration that still converges quadratically to the sine of the starting value, but it has quite a different character. Um, it's a rational, just a, a more general rational function. You can take your equation x squared minus one is naught and apply any method you like for solving nonlinear equations. And if you apply the Halley iteration. Uh, you come up with this formula. So this is a cubically convergent iteration for, well, in the scalar case, it would be the square root of 1. In the matrix case, it would be for computing the sine function. And uh, so this is quite nice. You, you now have got cubic convergence at the expense of uh, a little bit more work in evaluating that, that, uh, that expression. I noticed the, uh, there's a bit of a pattern here, 3, 1, 1, 3. Um, and Halley is just one of the whole family of iterations called the Pardé family, and um, there are intimate connections with Pardé approximants, approximants in this family. Uh, so there's a whole triangular table of iterations of which this is just one, and they tend to have this kind of symmetry in the coefficients on top and bottom. Um, notice also that this is an odd function of x. So there's lots of uh, symmetries in these iterations and lots of nice analysis to be done about their convergence. Um, I'll just mention this one further one. This is a Newton-Schultz iteration for the, the sine function. The advantage or the attraction of this one is that there's no inversion required. It's only matrix multiply. And so on a computer for matrices, that's pr probably going to be faster than 
an iteration that involves only inversion. However, while the first three iterations are globally convergent, they converge for any starting value or any matrix in the matrix case, this one only converges for starting values sufficiently close to 1 or minus 1. So this is not globally convergent. Uh, and so people have investigated the idea of using one of the iterations at the top for a while, and then once you get close to convergence, switching to this one, because this will be faster. So Newton-Schultz uh, is uh, an interesting iteration. And there are similar iterations for some related functions like the, um, the unitary polar factor, uh, something I've worked on quite a bit over the years. So as I say, there's a whole lot of interesting stuff there. That's just a little glimpse of it. Um, if you're interested, you can find out lots more in the, in the literature. Just one final comment on the sine function. A few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, um, I heard about through Andres Frommer, who's at Wuppertal University in Germany, about some applications in theoretical physics where they need the sine function. In fact, there they need the sine function times a vector. And they were looking into some ideas that go back to the Russian approximation theorist Zolotorov. So essentially what happened was that some numerical analysts working on the sine function rediscovered um, a, a classical approximation theory result by Zolotorov it, for scalar approximation of a sine-like function, and they used that to generate some uh, approximations that could be used in this application. So the physics application has got huge matrices, large and sparse, they want the sine function times a vector. And Andres Frommer and other people have written quite a bit about this in the last 10 years. I think one of the approaches is they, they end up using is Krylov methods. But this Zolotorov approximation is um, quite important in that, in that context. In fact, just a quick diagram. The, the sine, if you plot the sine function, it's basically plus one in the right half plane. Well, uh, the, 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 this is the sine function on the real, for real scalars. So there's a plot of sine x against x. So it's minus one if x is negative, it's plus one if x is positive. And rational approximations to this will try and reproduce that behavior but obviously, they, being nice smooth functions, they're going to have some sort of curvature. And so the question is, what's the, you know, what's the best rational approximation to this, um, this step function? And that's what the Zolotorov um, analysis answers. So if you say, I want a degree 3 over degree 3 rational, what's the best approximation in the infinity norm to the sine function? There'll be some curve, and it will have some kind of equi-oscillation properties. So there's some, some beautiful approximation theory behind all that. So the, the word there is Zolotorev. OK, let's move on to looking at, uh, having just mentioned sine of a times a vector, let's look at the f of a times a vector problem. So f is as before, it's our matrix function, b is a vector, and we want to compute f a b, but we don't first want to compute f of a because presumably f of a is too big, we can't even perhaps store it, let alone can, um, carry out the, the full computation. So the, the case where f is the inverse is of course everywhere, but that's a bit too special. So when we're talking about f of a, b, we, don't, we normally exclude the inverse function because it's just too special. And the techniques you apply there are, are rather different. So the sorts of f's we're thinking of are the exponential, as in the exponential integrators, log, square root, sine function, or any f you, you would like to plug in there. So how do we compute f of a times b without first computing f of a? So I think in general, the, the answer will depend on what f is. What, what method you use will depend to some extent on f. So let me mention one or two special cases. 
so this is this is the the case or the situation where the Cauchy integral formula for the for f of a, I think, is particularly useful. Because if we apply that Cauchy integral formula to our vector b, we get the equation at the top of the slide. So we've got inside the integral f of z times the resolvent acting on the vector b. And we can now think about using quadrature methods to approximate the integral. So a simple-minded way of doing this would be to look in the complex plane for the eigenvalues. They, in general, they can be anywhere. Now, uh, the contour gamma has got to enclose all the eigenvalues. So the simplest thing to do would be to take a circle that encloses the eigenvalues. And then we could integrate around the circle by parameterizing the circle uh, by, say, z is r e to the i theta. And then doing the trapezium rule, maybe the repeated trapezium rule for, for equispaced equi values of, uh, of theta. So it would become a one-dimensional integration around this circle. Um, in the case of a real matrix, the eigenvalues appear in complex conjugate pairs, so we'd only have to do one half of the circle, and then the rest would be the same by symmetry. So the most simple-minded approach then is just take a circle that definitely encloses the spectrum and apply repeated trapezium. So as described here, uh, we can take the centre of the circle, the average of the eigenvalues, the radius, half the, the maximum one. So we need to know the extremal eigenvalues here. Um, I guess I'm assuming the eigenvalues are real, am I? Uh, what am I assuming there? Uh, I think in this case I'm assuming we've got a symmetric post-death matrix for, for those uh, expressions. Um, that doesn't work very well, unfortunately. So if you take, so here I've got the 5 by 5 Pascal matrix. It's a um, symmetric positive matrix. There's the, the interval in which the spectrum lies. So if you do that for that matrix, you require 32,000 points, integration points, just for two digits, and over 200,000 for 13 digits. So it's, it's pretty hopeless for, even for this small, nice, in a sense, simple positive matrix. So the simple-minded approach isn't very powerful, but um, what I did with some work with Nick Hale and Nitra Thethan was to do some conformal mapping. So one of the problems is that your circle here can get very close to the extremal eigenvalues, and that can slow down convergence. So if you, if you map things around, a bit like Viola was talking about this yesterday, how you can uh, apply maps to change the distribution of points in, in all sorts of ways, um, you can make massive improvements. So, um, with a conformal map, we get down to five points for two digits and 35 for 30, and then some more work, and you can get this down to 29. So, just 29 evaluations of f, um, well, of the integrand up there, I should say, of f times the resolvent. Um, so, this approach certainly is um, feasible. Um, I'm not claiming this applies for general matrices A. So in, in that paper, in that work, we're mainly concerned with matrices that have um, real eigenvalues or eigenvalues very close to the real axis. But for that class of problems, with appropriate transformations, you can make this work quite well. Okay, but this, if you have a general non-normal matrix, um, uh, I'm not claiming this would work well at all. There, it, it's um, still, I think, unclear how, how best to, to do this. There are some uh, current methods that are being investigated by various people that compute eigenvalues via the idea of contour integration. So there's a, a package called FEAST, developed by, uh, developed by Eric Polizzi, who's at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, I think. And he's computing eigenvalues by um, enclosing um, or finding regions in the complex plane and counting how many eigenvalues there are in those regions. So there is quite a bit of work going on along this type of, uh, this type of line. But in all cases, what we're exploiting is the fact that we can compute zi minus a inverse b. So we have to be able to do that computation, which would be done by some, well, either by a backslash, if the matrix is not too big, by a, a sparse direct solve, or by a 
maybe a trial of subspace solver in the really large sparse case. So you need to be able to solve linear systems to, uh, to use this approach. And then we've got the binomial expansion. So for, if you want a, a fractional power of A times a vector, then a, a kind of first principles way of doing it is to just try to use a binomial expansion. So I, I can't expand A itself but if I can get A in the form I minus something, so if I, can, if I write A as S into I minus B, or C I'll call it, okay, so for some scalar S, um, some maybe in general complex scalar S, if I can write A in that form, then A to the alpha is going to be S to the alpha, I minus C to the alpha, and I can do a binomial expansion of I minus C to the alpha. Okay, and that expansion can then be applied to a vector B uh, to get this formula. And this is only going to work if I can ch arrange that the spectral radius of C is less than 1. So I need rho C less than 1. So the question is, can I choose S to achieve rho C less than 1? Well, if, uh, if the eigenvalues are all positive, then there is a value of S that does the job. So for that S, the average of the extremal eigenvalues, then the, um, I think that should say lambda max rather than lambda min. It's the largest eigenvalue I'm trying to bound. So lambda max, it should say, is given by that expression, which is certainly less than one, but it can be very close to one. Oh, okay, so what, yeah. So basically with that choice of S, I get that spectral radius. And if lambda max and lambda min are far apart, then that spectral radius can be close to one, and therefore the convergence of these powers to zero could be quite slow. But one interesting special case is where A is an M matrix. Now the definition of M matrix is essentially you can write it like this with um, S positive and C non-negative. Okay, that's really the definition of an M matrix. M matrices have got a huge literature. If you look at the journal uh, Linear Algebra and Applications, there's hundreds of papers on M matrices. Lots of interesting properties. So for an M matrix, um, this splitting is quite natural. Um, and for an M matrix, there are special results about the, um, the, the existence of, of roots of various types. So this would be quite natural for the M matrix case. And there are some other iterations you can set up along these lines. One of them turns out... so. You can play around with, in all sorts of ways with iterations for the square root. So for example, if I write, um, if I write this as i minus b squared and expand everything out, I, c I can set up an iteration for, for the matrix B. Uh, I can get a numerical iteration for computing square roots that way. And one of the ways of doing this leads to an iteration whose convergence analysis boils down to um, that the eigenvalues of a certain matrix lie in the Mandelbrot set. Okay. So the, remember the Mandelbrot set, that fractal stand, famous picture of uh, the heart-shaped region in the complex plane. Um, so one of these iterations is intimately related to that. And the, the Mandelbrot iteration is, of course, mapping a complex number well, the other way around, z goes to z squared plus c. So the Mandelbrot set is basically the set of z for which this iteration uh, is bounded. And you can see that it's not too hard to believe there's a connection between that and this kind of idea here. So there's some interesting um, 
analysis and the convergence of some of these iterations. Right, I think that's a good place to stop and have a break. So that was A to the alpha via binomial expansion. There is another um, interesting idea for the particular case of A to the alpha times a vector, which is to solve a differential equation. So if you look at this differential equation here with a rational function of A on the right hand side, then the uh, there's a unique solution given by this formula here. And if we put y is 1, we get a to the alpha b. So this was proposed in a paper in linear algebra and its applications in 2000. Uh, in the particular case, alpha is a half and with symmetric positive definite a by Allen, Bug, Lama and Boyd. So if you take this approach, you would probably think about applying some kind of uh, integrator to the differential equation, maybe one of the MATLAB uh, built-in integrators. and Let it do its step size selection to get you from 0 to 1, and then you'll have your a to the alpha b. So I've, I've not seen many other examples like this where there's an, a, you know, an appropriate differential equation to solve. Um, so I think there might well be more and people just haven't found them. But that, that's always an interesting idea to see if there's an appropriate equation that you can uh, show is equivalent to finding the, uh, the thing you want. Um, so to implement this method you'll have to keep repeatedly evaluating the right hand side so you'll need to be able to do solves with the, the matrix A. So the, the rest of this section specializes to the exponential the exponential is a particularly rich function with uh, a lot known about it. There's probably more papers on the exponential of the matrix than any other function except the inverse. And so here's a little table of nine different approaches that can be used, thinking first of all about e to the a itself rather than e to the a times a vector. So we've got the Taylor series, top left. We've talked about Taylor series already. There's a limit definition which is sometimes how the exponential is defined in a first uh, analysis course. That works in the matrix case. There's a perfectly good formula or characterization. Some people have actually pr proposed using that definition. And what they proposed is taking a sequence of S's, getting larger and larger, and trying to extrapolate the sequence to convergence. The, uh, the problem with that approach is that you tend to get numerical instability. So when you have a large value of S, you have i plus a s, a over s. Then if s is really large, then when you add these scaled elements to the identity, you lose the last few digits of the elements of a. They just get, they drop off the end of the computer word, because you've only got about 16 decimal digits to play with. So if s was 10 to the 6, um, the last, you know, the last few digits of a will get lost when you add to i. And then you power this up to the power s. And so you're raising to the power s something that's already lost a few digits. So that's, that, that's the source of uh, instability. So that, as far as I've seen, that formula has not really been successfully uh, used for computing e to the a. Scaling the squaring top right hand corner is, is a successful method, and I'll, I'll say more about that shortly. But the idea here is that if we, um, if we divide a by some appropriate scalar, and we've taken a power of 2 here, we can make the norm close to 1. We can then apply various approaches from the rest of the table. Um, and finally, then square back s times to get our original, the exponential of the original matrix. Uh, we've just seen the Cauchy integral formula. There's been plenty of work on using that, particularly by Nick Trefethen and um, Andre Weidemann. On, and choosing suitable contours, typically in the case that A is uh, symmetric, positive, semi-definite. We've seen the Jordan form already. And interpolation, so if you take our definition of interpolation, uh, interpolating polynomial to give f of A, then that would be the divided difference form of the interpolating polynomial in the top right, or the middle right. 
So you've got the divided difference of lambda 1 to lambda i, the first i eigenvalues of a, and you've got this product here. As far as I can see, that formula as it stands is not very useful. The, in particular, you've got this product of i minus 1 uh, matrices, that's going to be very expensive, and i can be as big as n, so in principle that's an order n to the 4 method for computing f of a. There are other interpolation formulae, the Lagrange formula, the barycentric formula. Um, I'm not sure these have been thoroughly investigated, so there might still be some interesting ideas to be applied with different forms of interpolation. But I haven't really seen too much along those lines. Um, there is some work on using layer points, um, which are a particular... Uh, well, the, it's not something I know too much about, but there is some recent work on in the large sparse case using interpolating uh, functions. Party approximants we've talked about already a little bit and in conjunction with scaling and squaring this is the, the basis of MATLAB's XBEM and probably the best general purpose method for computing e to the a. And These party approximants were the ones originally de de derived by Pardé in his PhD thesis over a hundred years ago and they have very nice properties. We could use the shear form in the conjunction with the shear parlet method. So that's a perfectly reasonable way of computing the exponential, to use the shear parlet formula. Uh, you still have to decide how to compute the exponential of the diagonal blocks, and for that you could use scaling and squaring, for example, or a Taylor series. And uh, differential equations, th there's a bit of an irony here in, in that usually people who want to solve a differential equation we'll ex try and express that as an exponential evaluation um, but you could go in the opposite direction, you could say you know, if I've got a good ODE solver I could use that to compute e to the a and we'll, we'll come back to that on the next slide and then there's the whole idea of Krylov methods which I think Marlies is going to say uh, plenty more about um, I'll just summarise the basic idea on a couple of lines here so you go for this factorisation with um, a Q having orthonormal columns rectangular Q You've got this um, rat one piece left over, and you approximate e to the a times b using the exponential of the much smaller Hessenberg matrix, and you've got this projection operator here, and uh, transforming back with q. So this reduces the problem to um, a much smaller matrix problem, e to the h times b, where h might be, say, 100 by 100. And then, of course, you have to ask, how do I compute this? And then any of the methods in the table could be applied to the e to the h part of the, the evaluation. OK, so there's a huge number of possibilities. If you look through the literature, you'll find you could fill in you know, several more tables with other methods that people have um, proposed. Most, th those methods are typically totally impractical, um, either because they're too expensive or they're numerically unstable. But it is a favourite pastime, maybe not so much nowadays, but 20, 30, 40 years ago. Coming at, oh, you come up with a new method for e to the a, you write a paper about it, you show it works on the 3x3 three three example. Uh, the journals are full of such papers, um, and they're mostly not very good. So there's a method called Putzer's method, for example. It's really an analytic formula for solving differential equations, and you can use it to get the exponential. Um, but it's not a practical method at all. It's, it's nice, it's of interest theoretically, but you would never dream of using it in, in practice. So there's many examples of, of that type of uh, formula. Somebody mentioned to me earlier this week they'd been looking at the, the classic paper by Muller and Van Loan called 19 Dubious Ways to Compute the Matrix Exponential, and I'd strongly recommend reading that if you haven't already. The first version of the paper was 1978. They published a re revised update in 2003. Uh, both of these were in sound review. And uh, the, uh, the original paper had 19 different classes of method for computing e to the a. And they did a comparison of these methods, weighed up the pros and cons, um, often gave analysis of the particular methods. So it's a really nicely written paper, great read. The title has been uh, quite influential. People have copied the title. Um, in fact, there's a good example of if you, if you choose a good title for your paper, it's more likely to be read, I think. It, but it is, a, it is a good paper anyway, this one. So method 6 out of the 19 is, uh, this is an extract from the paper here. So they say, let's apply single step ODE methods. 
So they said two of the classical techniques for solving differential equations are the fourth order Taylor and Runge Kutta methods with fixed step size. Now for y dashes a y, so our differential equation is now y dashes a y, uh, both Runge Kutta and Taylor series become the same, one and the same thing, and it becomes this. You get the new x from the old x by applying this polynomial, which is just the first five terms of the Taylor series. Okay. Um, and if you write that in the Runge Kutta form, then it looks like this, but it boils down to the same ultimate formula. So they talk about using uh, a fixed step size. So choose h, choose some h that's going to get you um, in steps of h from uh, 0 to 1, and then just apply this polynomial repeatedly to x to 0. So that's basically applying the Runge Kutta method with a fixed step size. So that was one of their uh, 19 dubious ways which they compared with other techniques. I remember th reading at the time, reading that paper, um, actually, my MSc was on, um, was on the solution of differential equations. And one of the reasons I ended up not doing that topic for the rest of my life was, that I think, probably this paper. Uh, and so the idea of you've got a special y dashes a y, you know, how do you exploit the fact that it's a special linear constant coefficient problem? Um, you know, somehow just applying the Runge Kutta method and just saying, let's take advantage. Let's just simplify the formula to this quadratic, but just apply a fixed step size. It somehow didn't seem very uh, intuitively appealing to me. I thought there might be something better that could be done, but at the time I had no idea how to do that. But um, I think this, this is one of the reasons why I ended up working in linear algebra, was reading this, uh, this paper. So in the rest of this section, I'll pick up on this idea and essentially take that idea and uh, refine it a little. Because the question is, how do you choose? How do you choose? Why have you chosen four here? Why is it a degree four polynomial? Why not take some higher degree? What's special about the four by f the fourth order Runge Kutta method? Um, and and how should you choose h? So there's no mention here of uh, a given accuracy. It's just let's integrate from naught to one with a certain step size. So we'll, we'll pursue that in the rest of this section. But I want to jump ahead to the section on software and come back to that um, probably tomorrow, in fact. So I want to talk about software for a little bit. So I want to do a little survey of what's available in, the, in different languages and packages for matrix functions, starting with MATLAB. So what, what MATLAB has today, FunM implements the shear parlette algorithm, as I descri described it yesterday. So reducing to shear form, reordering, blocking, and then evaluating the diagonal, uh, f of the diagonal blocks of the, of the triangular matrix. And you have to provide that function with the ability to compute derivatives of f. Now, there are some special cases built in, so if you, ask, if you want FunM to compute the cos or the sine or the exponential or the tangent, it, is, it, is built in, it knows how to compute the required derivatives. Um, but if it's an, a more general function, you'll have to provide the derivatives to it. Um, log M actually calls FunM, but when it computes the f of the diagonal blocks, or the log of the diagonal blocks, it uses, uh, well that should say, there's a missing word there, there should be a word inverse in front of scaling. So it's the inverse scaling and squaring method that is used on the diagonal blocks. But it's still within the shear parlet method. XBEM is the function for the exponential. That was originally written by Cleve Moller in the very early days of MATLAB, and it implements the method that's described in the 19 dubious ways paper. So what essentially they do is they uh, scale a down so that a over 2 to the s has norm about 1. I've forgotten the exact um, tolerance here, 
but they get this down to about one, and then they apply the 6-6 six, six, uh, party approximant, and then square s times. So that was the original XBEM using, uh, and the, ju the justification for that choice of 6-6 six, six degree is in the 19 dubious ways paper, that, so there's some analysis in that paper that leads to this choice. So that was the original XBEM. Um, it got replaced in 2005 by uh, a newer version that I developed. And my version has a more sophisticated way of choosing the degree of the party approximant and the amount of scaling S. It uses some sharper bounds. And what, what I'll say um, in the rest of the section on E to the AB will essentially explain that. So I'll explain the idea of what I mean by sharper uh, error analysis. So that's what XBEM does nowadays. It uses the uh, the more recent refined scaling and squaring approach. There are also three not very well known routines called XBEM Demo 1, 2 and 3. Uh, XBEM Demo 1 is actually the old XBEM that, that used to be XBEM before 2005. Demo 2 has a simple Taylor series approximation to the exponential. And Demo 3 uses the Eigen system, so it just does uh, a is x dx inverse, e to the a is x, e to the dx inverse, which we know is unstable in general. So though, I think those demo routines are just there for, for illustration. Uh, they're not really meant to be used seriously. Uh, square root m is the function for matrix square roots, and that uses the Bjork and Hamling method. It goes via the shear form and applies that finite recurrence to get the, uh, the square root. This works with the complex shear form only. So even if, even if you give it a real matrix, it will use the complex shear form. And it also has built into it the ability to evaluate the condition number of the problem. So it does some condition estimation um, to give you a, a condition number along with the computed square root. Um, so that's what's there right now in MATLAB. If you read Clean Molar's blog, he has a blog on the MathWorks website. I think it was about last, about a year ago, he had a blog post about XBEM and a user had found uh, an example where XBEM wasn't performing very well. What, what tends, uh, I sometimes get this from the MathWorks, if they, you know, obviously they've got too many users, so users are regularly contacting them with problems. I guess most of the time those problems are pretty straightforward for the help desk to, an to, to answer. You know, people not understanding how to call a function or misunderstanding something. But then sometimes they get more interesting problems coming through. They, they, from my experience, they tend to be very badly scaled problems. So some people have got matrices with you know, elements 10 to the 100, 10 to the minus 100, all sorts of, all over the place, the, the scale of the problem. And so sometimes these badly scaled matrices can cause problems with, uh, with codes. And there was one that came up where XBEM was giving a, a rather poor answer than you might have expected. So it was a very badly scaled problem. In fact, the condition number was huge. So in a sense, you, you couldn't really expect to get an accurate solution. But I think the user had tried XBEM, and then they tried something else. They might have tried XBEM Demo 3, for example, and found that on this particular example, XBEM Demo 3 actually did rather well and better than XBEM. Um, so there's a nice blog post by Cleave in fact, I should add, I'll add, it to the, I'll add a link to the slides. So you can just click and go to it. And so what Cleve did was, he looked at the choice of S and degree that XBEM was making, and he forced it to try some different choices. And it turned out that, the so he had a little plot of, uh, it was, I think it was something like, the, the degree of the party approximant, m, on the x-axis against the error in the computed exponential. And this plot had a peak just at the very choice of m that um, XBEM makes. So XBEM was making the worst possible choice of m, as it happened in this case. Which is was just, it was just a rather freak example, freakish example, where um, Bec and, and due to, you know, the problem is so badly scaled you couldn't even really expect to get a good answer. But it turns out that the, the more recent improvements we've made to um, this algorithm, working with my former student Al Moe, actually doesn't have this, this issue. 
So the, the XBEM I mentioned there is based on my 2005 paper. We had a later 2009 paper that had an even more refined analysis that, uh, and for this problem, that newer refined code uh, works fine. Uh, but it, it's always good to get these examples because uh, it does make you think more carefully about uh, the behavior of the algorithms. So I'll, I'll put a link to that on this slide when I revise them. So I'm, I've been revising the slides as I go along all week. Um, unfortunately, the slides are quite big and um, I also can't connect to my web page to upload. So I've not been able to upload a new version to my website. Uh, and since I'm still working on the slides even now, uh, I think probably the best thing is that when I get home, um, I will, from home, I'll, I'll, at the weekend, I'll upload a new version. Okay, I've still got some things I want to add for tomorrow. So there'll, there'll be a, a new, complete version of the slides available from um, Sunday. So what about third-party functions, ones that aren't built into MATLAB? I've got a, a toolbox called the Matrix Function Toolbox that was produced around the same time I was writing my book. And it goes along with the book in that it, uh, it gives codes to implement most of the algorithms in the book. So things like uh, computing the condition number of a function or uh, a version of the square root routine that works with a real sure form, uh, those sorts of things are in there. Um, so there's about 30 functions in that uh, toolbox, so it's worth having a look at. Expo Kit was written in 1998 by Roger Sidgi, and this has been used quite a bit over the years because it's a, it's a Kraloff method for e to the a times a vector, and there aren't that many publicly available Kraloff solvers around, so people very often use his method as a, a code when they're testing. So it's, a, you know, it's not a super sophisticated code, it's, it's not that long, it's a few screenfuls of MATLAB. Um, but people often use this Krylov code um, when they're doing tests of their own Krylov or other method for e to the ab. Um, he also had some Fortran codes in that, in that toolkit, so both MATLAB and Fortran. And he was particularly interested, because he did his PhD at the University of Rennes in France with Bernard Philippe, and he was particularly interested in Markov chain problems. So there's some, in the paper that goes with that uh, toolkit, there is some, some discussion of specialising to the case of A being a, a matrix from a Markov chain. Uh, a recent paper in ACM Man Trans Math Soft is this, uh, describes this XBint uh, code, which will compute linear combinations of phi functions, and they give a MATLAB code for that. So XBint is available for the combination of phi functions. There are also codes in the NAG library. And NAG, the NAG library, how many of you, have any of you not heard of NAG before? Um, the, well, the NAG library is a 40-year-old software company. So it's one of the oldest software companies in the world. It's based in Oxford. It was originally founded by four universities, I think Manchester, Nottingham, Oxford, I think there's one other. So back in the 1960s, all these universities had an I, a certain ICL computer, ICL 1902 or something. And so people in my department were writing codes in Fortran for that computer, for solving ODEs particularly. And they wanted to share these codes with other people. They, know, they knew that Nottingham and Oxford had the same computer, so they said, you know, why don't we just share our codes and form some sort of library? Uh, so they did that. And I think they got some funding to, to make a little library. So it was an entirely academic effort. And it was quite successful, and people, other people wanted to start using the codes. So that led to the formation of NAG as a, as a company, uh, a not-for-profit company, originally based at the University of Oxford, just a small you know, one- or two-man outfit. And NAG has become um, a pretty successful company now with, I don't know, the order of maybe 100 employees. It, they, they have an office in the, in the Oxford area, and they, uh, their main product, I guess, is the NAG library. So it's a collection of a few thousand, by, by today, um, codes, originally in Fortran, and I think the key, the sort of engine of the library is still in Fortran, but there are versions of the library in C, and the versions that can be called from Excel or all sorts of um, different uh, settings. So, you know, this is one of the, the, most, the longest, most established, and um, I guess most successful scientific software libraries. And a few years ago they produced a toolbox for MATLAB. So the idea was that you could, if you didn't want to write high-level code, 
Fortran and C++ or whatever, you could call the NAG library from Fortran. Now in the UK, um, if you're in a university, you get access to the, the NAG library um, free of charge. So all academics in the UK um, get the use of, of, of the library. And anyone who has the library gets the toolbox for free anyway. So uh, you can call so you can call NAG library functions for matrix functions from this toolbox uh, if you're using MATLAB. So originally there was an exponential code um, and some general functions of symmetric and Hermitian matrices. So not very much at all there. But so I had a project funded about three years ago to it's under the auspices of knowledge transfer. So there's a lot of effort in the UK to take ideas out of universities into, into industry. And so I got some funding to transfer the work that we'd done at Manchester on matrix functions into uh, NAG library codes. So we have a full-time uh, postdoctoral researcher who is coding algorithms for the NAG library. And uh, so what follows in these subsequent bullet points is summarizing uh, the work that he's done. So some of those routines are already in the library. Um, the shear polyet algorithm is there. The inverse scaling and squaring algorithm for the matrix logarithm is there. And the, um, the release earlier this year of Mark 24 and the corresponding updated toolbox that will come next month contain the action of the exponential on a, another vector or matrix. And that's what I'll continue in the, in the FAB section describing that algorithm. And it's also got condition estimation for matrix functions as well. And there's more things coming next year, matrix square root, matrix powers, um, some, some of the work that Lijing and I have done on matrix powers was going in there, um, and um, all sorts of uh, fresh iterative and condition number uh, computations for all these functions as well. So the, the library's going to have a very uh, comprehensive set of matrix function codes. These are all written in Fortran, so whereas sometimes MATLAB can be quite slow if you have a loop, um, these are written in Fortran and will in some cases be much faster than the MATLAB equivalents. Uh, it all depends on what your code looks like. So the, the MATLAB code for XBEM, for example, all it really does in terms of significant computation is matrix multiply on solving linear systems. That's really just about all there is to it. So those things are done by calls to the BLAS or LAPAC within MATLAB, so they're very fast. So the rest of the code is just of minimal cost. So an XBEM written in Fortran is not going to be much faster, if at all faster, than the XBEM written in MATLAB. Whereas the shear parlet algorithm does have some loops in it, and that's where you might well get some significant speed up over uh, uh, implementing in a high-level language. Um, and the documentation for all those routines there. Now, you've, I think you've had an email from forwarded from Wei Guo yesterday, and there's also a printout on the wall there. So NAG have kindly um, sponsored this summer school by way of providing um, licenses for anybody who's attending the summer school. So you can get your own personal license for uh, the NAG toolbox for MATLAB, um, the Fortran compiler if you want. Um, and to do that, you just have to, well, anybody can download the, um, the whole NAG software so the, the thing you need to run is just to get the, the license code. And it tells you in the email how to get that. If, you, if you, have to, you have to email somebody to get the right license code. So this is, I, th I, think, I think there's a time limit on this. I'm not sure quite how long it is. But um, it's well worth it if you've got the interest and the time to, to, to try this out um, and get access to the MAG library. You might also want to check if you have access via your university. As I say, in the UK, we do have access in all universities to the MAG library. Your, your university may outside the UK have purchased the library anyway because it, it is quite widely used. Um, so have a look at the email from, um, from Wei Guo and uh, feel free to pursue that. What about some other languages and packages? Well, have you heard of Octif? It's a MATLAB clone, an open source package, uh, GNU Octif it's sometimes called. Um, it's got an exponential code though it's based on a 1978 algorithm by Bob Ward. So what I've found with these open source packages is that it seems that the people developing them are not numerical analysts and they just tend to sort of find an algorithm and implement it and then not, they don't necessarily look for the best algorithm. So the XBEM in Octave is really way out of date, it's a very old implementation. Um, LogM uses the Eigen system. 
which we've just seen several times is unstable. So, so the log m is very unreliable in Octave. Um, square root m does do the right thing. It uses the Bjork and Hamling method. And they've got quite a few trigonometric uh, codes, including inverse trigonometric functions, under the heading THFM. And unfortunately, what they've done is they've looked in a textbook and found some textbook definitions of, you know, you can define certain functions in terms of others. So you can define trig functions in terms of the logarithm, for example. Um, so they just translated some of these formulae from a textbook into, into code. Uh, and as a result, their codes are not very good. You have to be very careful with using these textbook formulae. Because uh, you know, they may be okay analytically, but numerically they can be very uh, dodgy. So I wouldn't recommend um, using THFM at all. Um, Python. SciPy is one of the main libraries for Python. And it does have, uh, in the Linalge package, a whole load of matrix functions. Um, so for XBEM, they are using my 2005 algorithm. Uh, FunM, they're using sheer parlette, but unfortunately the unblocked version, so the one that can uh, divide by zero. So that's, that's not too good. But they do have uh, various trigonometric functions. And I find out that... Uh, I had a blog entry about the Siam Computational Science and Engineering Conference that was held in February. And one of the comments put on the blog was by someone who must, I guess must be a SciPy developer, and they said that we're working currently on several other uh, functions for SciPy, uh, which are based on, some, I guess, some of my more recent work. So there's the Fresh deriv derivative of the exponential. They've got the one norm estimator. Um, this is the e to the a times a b problem, exponent multiply. And um, they've done a blocked square root that's, that gives better performance. Um, that refers to the last part of my slides, but, um, where I've, I've got the case study about the square root function and how to make it run faster. So they've already seen that paper and started to code it themselves. So um, it's good to know that some people are, are looking at the, the latest work and putting that into Python. Does anybody use R here? It's incredibly popular in statistics. Um, there's a vast number of books on R published by Springer. Um, I think if you work in stats, then R is like MATLAB is to us. So there is a package for the exponential. So R is completely open source. And it has this um, CRAN is the complete R archive network, I think. Um, and so XBEM has actually my most, re most recent um, algorithm in it. They've actually, rather oddly, they've included in, in XBEM several different methods. So when you call their XBEM, you have to say which one you want. So do you want, you know, you can have my latest one, an old one, or an even older one. Um, I don't quite know why they've done that. You know, why would you not want to use my method? I can't understand, you know. Why would you want to use this older method? Um, but that's the way they've done it. So they've got condition numbers, derivatives, log and square root. Um, but all within a package called XBEM. So I don't quite know why they called it XBEM if it's got logs and square roots in it. So it should really be called something like FUNEM. It's a, a matrix function package more generally. And then C++. I don't know very much in C++ other than Yitzhak Neeson, who's at the University of Leeds, has written a package for Eigen. So Eigen, Eigen is a widely used C++ package for linear algebra. And he's written a module for it that does some uh, matrix function computations. Um, so these, these functions here. Uh, I think he's using the latest uh, algorithms for that. So I wanted to have a quick discussion about languages because we've been talking about this a bit in, in our group in Manchester. So the particular angle on this is that you know, we're doing research in, say, matrix functions. We, we derive some new algorithms. We test them. We, we produce something that we think works pretty well. What's the best way of making those algorithms available to other people? And I'm thinking, well, there's two, two aspects of that. So one is you want other researchers to be able to run your code so that they can, they can maybe come up with a be something better and compare it with yours. You know, so there's a way of comparison. 
but you also want people who actually need these things in, in practice to, to, to have access to them. So scientists and engineers who aren't mathematicians, who have got a matrix function they need to compute, you want them to be able to get the code and use it. Now, up to now I've really only made my codes available in MATLAB, or more recently in, in Fortran form through the MAG library. And so we're debating a bit on whether that's the right thing to do, because MATLAB is proprietary, not everybody has MATLAB, it's expensive. In fact, if you're outside academia, it's a lot more expensive. For people in industry, it's, it's really quite expensive. So for a small company, you might not be able to afford MATLAB. Um, so is MATLAB the right way to make codes available? Or should we use some other language, some open source, um, you know, just general purpose language? Like, for example, C++ or, or Python. Um, Python has incredibly wide usage uh, in areas like neuroscience, astronomy. If you were at that meeting in, in the SIAM meeting in Boston last February, you would have heard a huge number of talks on Python, including a brilliant keynote talk about um, discovering new stars by observational astronomy, classifying stars, and they seem to use Python for everything. So should we be making our codes available in Python? And would that give better impact to our, our research? Because in the UK, impact is a huge thing now. Um, as an academic, you have to show that your work is having impact. So it's not enough just to say, um, oh, I've written a paper and it's had all these citations and the paper describes an algorithm. You've got to show that people are actually using the algorithm. And ideally, you want to show that there's some financial benefit to, um, to the use of the algorithm. And that, now, that's hard, but at least you can try and get people using it in the first place. So does anybody have any thoughts on, uh, on languages and uh, w w what language should we be making our... Yeah. Mm. And they've included it in, in SciPy, have they? Yeah, and some yeah. versions yeah. of SciPy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm a big fan of open source, and so we yeah. Mm. yeah. I just want to add that, in the, at least in the US, the computer science, for undergrad computer science, are moving to Python. So mm. your developers coming out of undergraduate are going to be yes. right. most comfortable. They will know Python, yeah. 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 I was at a, a workshop last summer um, and working with a woman from Bowen. She uh, she seemed to think that industry would actually start moving to Python instead of using MATLAB. Mm. She's working in their uh, their applied math division. So. Right. Okay. So lots of votes for Python so far. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to make the case for C plus plus or C? <laughs> yeah, Peter. Well, it's, so um, if you want to combine it with GPUs or something like that. C++ and CUDA is still one thing to go. Because, I mean, there is a CUDA extension yeah. for Python, but it's not that mm. evolved yet. I mean, it's working quite fine. And you yeah, can't really use OpenCL if you want to access all the possibilities of your mm. um, well, new card. Right. Uh, yeah, and the other thing is that there are some codes, it will always be the case that some codes are just not very fast in Python or MATLAB because they have a lot of loops in them. And, and those sorts of codes are better written in C or Fortran and then somehow brought into Python or whatever via a library like LAPAC. Um, so ultimately, what, you know, you could always do that. You could, you could write the, in the high-level language and then get it in some other library that gets used by uh, Python or C++ or whatever. Um, any other thoughts? Does anybody actually use Python seriously for numerical computation? You have, Tanya, yeah. Yeah. And do you like it? I love it. Hmm? I will use Phoenix, which is also the open source finite element package. Yeah. It's yeah. Not right. Yeah. I've, I've done a little bit of investigation, and the Python matrix syntax is quite similar to MATLAB, but, but, but sometimes it becomes quite different. So. It looks like it will be a little infuriating at first because, you, you know, you write a few lines, it's exactly the same as MATLAB, and then something is completely different than MATLAB. Um, but how, have you got used to it? There are sheets online that save Python for MATLAB users. Yeah. And, uh, it just, yeah. just needs a copy of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, yeah. object-oriented programming is perfect in Python because it doesn't look at that as well. And MATLAB yeah. is just convenient. Right, yeah. Malice? Yeah. There's a comment on, on MATLAB. So I had one post on working at the math works and Jared was pretty much surprised that it seems like they they are not investigating uh, 
uh, investing in math improvement so much mm. in the math books. So they are more investigating in things they can sell better. And of course, one can understand things as a company, and their major goal is, is to, to gain a lot of money. So they, they uh, invest a lot on the stimulating stuff. But they are not very much interested in, for instance, improving uh, uh, mathematics inside of core subroutines like uh, solving ordinary differential equations. Mm -hmm. So I, I was quite disappointed to, to experience this. But I think that was yeah, the part of, of, of method at the very beginning that they had mm -hmm. the best and sophisticated numerical analysis algorithms I think if they uh, stop to continue on trying to get the scientists uh, putting their, their new achievements in there, like, like you mentioned, to have the new XM implementation mm. uh, included in that lesson, um, I think uh, yeah, in the long run, mathematics will uh, move to something else. Yeah, um, I actually saw Bobby Cheng a couple of weeks ago in. Um, at the, Stanford, the San Diego meeting. So, so Bobby Cheng is the sort of lead of the maths team now at the MathWorks, and he, he was a student of mine in the late 90s. They have just hired two new people, two new um, people who are currently postdocs in numerical analysis. One of them is a student of Daniel Kresner. The other one I've forgotten, I think they're coming from Germany. Um, so they are expanding the team right now. They did tell me it's actually quite hard to hire people. It's quite hard to get people with the right knowledge and background that they require to do the sort of things Molly's was saying. Um, because largely people coming out of graduate school are not so familiar with the numerics to the level that they would need. Um, but it also is true that they make their money from things like Simulink. So, I so, so my, my postdoc made several suggestions on how to improve this, yeah. this and this. Yeah. The experience that it's just impossible. They, they, they don't want to do it. Yeah. And, and so the question then is, well, how, how are MathWorks so successful? If Python's out there with a growing audience and starting to do everything MATLAB can do, why does anybody use MATLAB? Well, the answer appears to be that a lot of companies need support for their software. When something goes wrong, they want to have somebody they can ring up and say, look, there's a problem, help me fix it. And that's, what, that's why a lot of companies w will only use a commercial software package like MATLAB. And they will, you know, they'll get specialist support. Um, Toyota um, are totally a MATLAB house now. So all Toyota cars, parts, are developed using Simulink. So if you want to be a supplier for Toyota, if you want to develop a part for a part of the Toyota car, Toyota will give you a Simulink description of that part and say, right, go and make it. So you're, you're going to have to buy MATLAB. So it's that sort of uh, leverage on, on the whole industry that they have and is, is why they're doing still incredibly well. Um, so uh, there's a whole market will be happy with Python, but it seems there are people who, companies who uh, want to pay for you know, that 24 hour support, get something fixed within the hour if something goes wrong. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, the different angles on this. Um, right, well thanks for those comments, that's very useful. Um, so tomorrow I will finish off on the F of A, B part. Now that's not going to take me the whole um, lecture, so what I thought I might do is in the second half of the lecture give a few more, talk a bit more generally about a few things like um, how to choose research problems, how to, maybe a bit about how to write, a bit about um, reproducible research. Would that sound of interest? Yeah. yeah. So something a bit less technical for the second half of the talk tomorrow. Great. So I'll, I'll prepare some slides for that and uh, we'll, we'll finish off the current slides and, and do that tomorrow. Great. Stop there. So a 20-minute 20, 20 break until Marlies is talking.